We are back. Welcome to the Leadership Launchpad Project. I'm Rob Kalvaroski, and as always, we're going to find out the dirt today, folks. We have uh -oh. my co-host, Susan Hobson. Susan, how are you? What dirt? Dirt? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. My backyard is clean and full of grass. So I know we're going to definitely probably be putting me on the hot seat, but I can't <laughs> wait to put our guest on the hot seat either. I have to say, there's been a lot of big news happening up here north of the border. I have to share with all of our international listeners, we had a big announcement in Hockey Canada this week. Uh, we had our CEO and uh, president uh, resign and the, the entire board. And I just have to, because our guest today played hockey at Princeton with me, I have to ask and get his two cents in terms of all this disruption we're seeing in Hockey Canada right now. What are your thoughts on that, Neil? You know what? I'm not even I'm not even going to be political on this one. Um, Please don't. It was, it, it was about time. It was about yeah. time. I mean, when you talk about leadership, one of my um, – I don't think this is a controversial person to follow. I hope not, at least. Yeah. Uh, Scott, Gall Scott Galloway, who uh, does run at NYU and, and on the podcast Pivot, he always says whenever this stuff happens, the top guy or gal need to take responsibility, make changes. And the fact that Amen. Hockey Canada was shirking it for so long. Um, mm -hmm. And what kind of message was that sending to the thousands, you know, the hundreds of thousands of kids and people that play under that banner, mm -hmm. I think was was terrible. I mean, I think that um, the fact that it had the sponsors had to put that much pressure on it. And I think, quite frankly, I think there's been a, um, an attitude in Hockey Canada that has dribbled down even to some of the provincial levels of this. Wasn't hockey great back in the 70s when we were playing against the Soviet <laughs> Union and men were men. And it's yeah, just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what's happened is, um, just taking it even a step further, we're pricing kids out of hockey at the younger levels because we're allowing these pay-to-play academies come in. And a lot of it is because mm -hmm. of the greed at the top level. I mean, it just really is. It just it filters back up. So I'm... I'm so glad that this change was made. I hope that um, the committee that has, is being put in place to 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 help make the change is actually going to um, be realistic about it. And I hope that it gives us a chance to look at the culture that is hockey top to bottom. And as you said, you and I were fortunate enough to play together at Princeton. And mm -hmm. um, I think there's so many ground changing events happening in the hockey world right now, whether it's the rise of the women's game, whether it's um, the opportunity for coaches to be breaking down barriers, whether it's on the gender side or whether it's on um, the innovation of the way that we're teaching youth to try to catch up because the rest of the world's passing Hockey Canada. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. just, I hope we take this opportunity. Amen. I love that. And obviously that voice is... Neil Stevenson Moore, he's the chief product officer from the House of Kaba. But before we get into the NFTs and Web3, Neil, what do the folks out there have to know about Susan at Princeton? <laughs> uh, edit, edit, delete. <laughs> uh, no, and actually, you know what? You know what? I, I will be honest. I met Susan on my recruiting trip, and that was the only reason I went. So I'll be okay. um, no, no. I will leave it at that. Thank you, Neil. No. Susan, oh Susan has been who she is today the whole time. Right she, right. Was, she, she was someone that was so kind and so generous. Um, with with especially, um, I had a lot of friends. So Susan was one year ahead of me at, at, at Princeton, mm -hmm. and so I had a lot of friends that were on uh, the girls that were on her team that were my year, and they all said she was an incredible leader and, and someone that. Um, Actually, I will tell this story. Why not? I mean, <laughs> if we were if we were ever out socializing uh, and someone needed to step up and draw a line, you could you could be, you could be sure Susan was the one stepping up and drawing a line for the whole room, and in a in a way that only this oh sassy, God. good looking, uh, oh but just uh. it looks just the kind one of the kindest people ever. So. Oh, and I, I didn't know, I mean, I follow Susan so much and I was just so excited. So, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm so happy to be here. The other thing I want to know, did she ever drop the gloves? <laughs> you know what? I, I wouldn't have put it past her. We went and watched a bunch of games. Um, I, I might have heard about one or two stories in practice where she had to keep people in line. But, uh, <laughs> 
It was all. I, would, I, I wouldn't tempt her. <laughs> I was mama bear. That was my whole shtick on my team. Like nobody messed with my girls. And no. it's the same way I am as an actual mother today, right? It's the same way I am with my team today, right, Rob? I'd drop the gloves for you, buddy, in a heartbeat. <laughs> I think I think one of my favorite things about a great leader, and I think this this would sum up Susan, she would never drop the gloves if someone insulted her. She would never make it about her. But if someone went after someone on her team, you better watch out. Like, I mean, that was kind of, and accurate. I think that's a sign of a great leader right there. I knew I was going to love this. This is amazing. Thank you, Neil. Oh, so kind. Neil, you've got to plug our audience in, buddy. Tell our audience about the mission you've been on since our time together at Princeton. Sure. So, I mean, for me, it was, um, as I said, I came out, I played one year pro, and then I went right into tech. It was something that um, I think we were so lucky. Our our generation is fascinating. We came out in a time where computers were introduced to us in high school. Um, you know, in, in in reality, you know, we I know we all had them a little bit growing up. But I remember my father just being like, "Don't be on there," and I kept breaking it by trying to learn how to code and whatever else. Um, <laughs> you know, a lot of us got our first laptop. And we went to to university, mm-hmm. um, and then when I came out, I mean, my first company I, I started because people were using phones on their, uh, sorry, uh, cameras on their phones when shopping. I sold that. And then the, I'm really excited right now because um, I'm in the next generation of things, which is Web3. And I think that the, coming back on Hockey Canada a second ago, the biggest thing that Web3 is, is accountability. And people don't really understand that. I mean, a lot of people hear NFTs and and quite frankly, I hate the way a lot of NFTs are, this concept of the very stupid looking animals that, um, but that, that, you know, people look at and go, why the hell is someone spending millions of dollars for that? Yeah. And, you know, the first thing crypto was in a lot of ways was money laundering it still is in some ways. And, <laughs> and, and it, 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 there's a store of value there, mm-hmm. but what the promise of blockchain is, is the promise of accountability. It, it, it's a better connection between the creator of a digital good and whoever holds that good. And the reason this is so important, and a lot of people, I love this analogy because I, I, I like you, Susan, I've been coaching, this is the first year I didn't coach, uh, this is the second year I didn't coach, I'm a little boy now that's two. Aww. And, um, but after, you know, getting out of university, I, I saw it as a, a way that I could give back to all the great coaches that helped me. Mm-hmm. But the way that the youth hang out nowadays is so different. So the boys yeah. I coach are, you know, 13, 14, 13, 14, 15. And after a game Friday night, they're like, oh, we're all going to go hang out. I'm like, oh, don't get in trouble down by the gas station out, out <laughs> by the rec center. Yeah. And they look at me and they like I'm on, I'm smoking something. They go, yeah. what do you mean? We're all going to go home to our individual homes, put on our headsets and play NHL together. Oh, wow. Th- this is the way they hang out. And yeah. the uh, there's two other things that people don't understand about the next generation. The first is, Everyone says that they have no attention span, and it's just not true. Mm-hmm. The difference is they were raised in a swiping world, whether mm-hmm. it was Facebook or Instagram or the way they meet you know, their prospective mates on Tinder or on Bumble or on Snack. Uh, I don't really know which the right ones are. I'm, I'm probably sound like <laughs> a, fog- a foggy saying that. But on MySpace. I'm, 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 I haven't oh, been God. on one in a long time. But... The difference is it's not that they have a short attention span. They just process information so much faster. Mm. But the second they find something they're into, they go deep. They will literally watch every episode of a show in one sitting. They will then go and look at all about that creator and all about that other actor. And they get into things, in, into being a, a true, like, it's kind of the equivalent of us back in the day when we bought our albums and you took out the album art and read all the the music, and, and yep. that's a big thing people miss. And the last piece, and this is what everyone needs to understand, everyone that's 30 plus, we used to meet in person. So I'd meet mm-hmm. Susan at, at TI and be like, hey, why don't we connect on Facebook or why don't yeah. we connect digitally? Yeah. Well, we'd meet in person first. This generation, they meet digitally first and then decide if they're going to meet in person. And that that is a monumental shift mm-hmm. when you really think about it because 
on one side of things, it's scary because how do you know who that other person is digitally? I mean, there's a lot of people that create these fake accounts and mm -hmm. with all the AI software out there today that lets you create avatars that look real. <laughs> um, and this is where blockchain can come in and Web3 and allow you to know who it is you're talking to. Now, they might call themselves sassy kitty 54321, but because of uh, NFTs and blockchain, you'll be able to see, no, actually, they did attend this restaurant on this night and went to this concert here, and they have this certification from this program. Um, actually, one of the things we'll have to chat about is a company we work with called Rise and Shine. Susan, you will love this one. It's, it's like TikTok meets, meets Instagram, uh, TikTok meets Masterclass. And it's got some incredible people, but the, the way that they're working with youth is they're giving these bite-sized lessons to certify and teach some different things. But oh, cool. anyway, it's, oh, yeah, that's what gets me that. excited. That's what get, gets me up. And I think with the opportunity for leaders in this space has become democratized. It's something where, you know, you're finding musicians now that are shirking um, Spotify because you don't get paid based on listener count. 90% of the money goes 3% of the artists. So they would much rather create small communities where 5,000 people buy their album and they make way more money and can actually have that connection to that fan group. Mm -hmm. um, and it's exciting. Uh, and I'm sorry, guys, I know I can keep talking, but... Well, I just, flip. I want, I want you to just tell us what this Web3 <laughs> thing is, Neil, because I, I'm like, my jaw is on the floor for the listeners who aren't watching this on YouTube, right? Because I have an 11 year old girl and I definitely am more hip to the ways of this current generation of adolescents than I've ever been having watched her patterns of behavior over the last three years of a pandemic, Right. All that homeschooling and everything. And so if I had an appreciation before the pandemic, my mind is just blown now. Right. Because everything that Neil is suggesting is true, is true. Like this is she she's on this Roblox game and that's what she wants to do with her free time. I was outside playing street hockey, as we can all imagine. That is no longer the case. <laughs> she wants to come home and she wants to get on this game with her friends and she wants to game. And so. Yeah, how does Web3 come into all of this? Just so we can make sure our audience is really understanding what it is that you're throwing down in that regard. Sure, so the easiest way of explaining uh, uh, Web3, forget everything you hear about fungible, non-fungible, made up words, stupid, whatever. All Web3 is, is it's di ownership, sorry, provable ownership of a digital good. Okay, so... Mm -hmm. Some people go, oh, that's a joke. I can just take a screenshot of that. Now I own it too. Mm -hmm. But it, it goes so much further than that. The, the images, these NFTs that everyone equates it with, that was just the first evolution of, of these things. When you go to a hockey game and your ticket is going to be a digital good that you own, that you can sell. When you go to a restaurant, your reservation would be on one of these digital goods that you own. Right. Um, and if I even though they might look the same and I have a screenshot of it, you have a screenshot of it. There's a way of proving that my account owns that screenshot and yours doesn't. So when oh. you and I both show up to the hockey game with the same ticket, with the same barcode, mm -hmm. what they'll actually do is as much as they scan the barcode, it also then cross references that to make sure that you're the person that is registered on the blockchain holding it. Oh, wow. So like we're working with a couple of universities in Italy that are transitioning all of their, um, uh, certificates, their, so their, their graduation mm. certificate to the blockchain. Mm. Your daughter will likely not. The piece of paper won't mean anything. Mm. I can go. I can go on LinkedIn right now and say that I graduated from Oxford with my master's or my doctorate, mm -hmm. and the world would look at it and go, "Okay, you know, maybe, maybe not." Mm -hmm. But in the future, everything you'll have to have had that, that blockchain connection to be able to post this. So. They will verify people online, which protects a lot of people as well. So your daughter, if she meets some guy that claims that he, you know, I don't know, works <laughs> at a certain company or does ever, yeah. they'll be able to prove it. Wow. Does that help? Does that make yeah. sense? <laughs> I feel like Rob's got a million questions. Well, Our no MIT more engineer. Tinder swindler, I guess. <laughs> oh, there'll always be that. Let's be honest. I mean, there's always, as quick as things come up, things get broken but mm -hmm. it's uh 
it is pretty exciting. It's because it's it is and it is a bit of the wild west out there right now. I was just in a in a conference at, at a conference in Vegas, um, which my wife's gonna kill me for saying this, but I think that was probably the we were a two year old. Yeah. So I was probably the only person in Vegas going, I'm so happy I came to Vegas to get a good night's sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, the only person. Yeah. The oxygen they pipe in is real nice, actually. <laughs> it was great. I felt I felt amazing, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And those no, but men. there's there's so many there's so many people doing interesting things. I mean I'm 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 less bullish on some of the metaverse opportunities. However, having said that. As you just said with your daughter, this is where they live. This is where mm-hmm. they play. This is where they hang out. And this is where they flex, right? Mm-hmm. They're going to, when she goes and she buys, so here, here's the interesting thing, right? This is where it'll get crazy. I know where you're going and I want you to go here because I literally had this conversation with her before. I'm like, you know, you're putting money towards something that is like not real, right? And I'm like, it's <laughs> my responsibility exactly to I'm teach going. you the value of a dollar. And she's like, mom, it is real. <laughs> I was like, oh, please, but, Neil, help me. But but, he, but here's what's going to happen. You will, in 10 years, you will never buy something of value without also getting a, a digital certi- certificate that proves that it, you actually own it and that it is from a thing. Mm-hmm. So if you someone goes and buys a Gucci purse, they'll mm-hmm. get a digital thing, they'll have a wallet on their phone, and that, if, and that will represent it. So now you'll be able to go into the metaverse connect that and have that Gucci purse as well on your avatar, right? And when you go meet, when your daughter goes and is hanging out and she's got those new, that new Supreme sweatshirt or those new yeah. Adidas crossover sneakers um, on her avatar, she's going to, it's like, it's going to be like us that first day of school when we walked yeah. in, you got all your clothes and you're all yeah, ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's what gonna they're going to be. They're going to be so excited to get home and walk in the metaverse with this new outfit. But, it, but the good news is, It'll be moving away from these skins and getting towards actually the, a digital twin of a real world good. Okay, so let's play this tape forward, Neil. We're talking about the metaverse now, and I feel like that's something we want to plug our audience into, too. Um, for those out yeah. there who don't realize what the metaverse is, could you tell us a little bit about that? And then let's play that game tape forward, shall we? Like, what is that going to mean for big business? Because we've got a bunch of leaders listening right now who definitely need to pay okay. attention to this. Absolutely. So um, you can certainly get distracted if you listen to a lot of the stuff that's coming out from some of the major companies, which I won't <laughs> name, but might have something similar with the metaverse. Um, it's the, the metaverse has already exist, right? The, the easiest examples of them are the video games. And it, it, it's, but it's kind of a nebulous concept. When people think about it, they always think about that movie Ready Player One, where I'm going to walk in and I'm going to live my life in this digital environment with an avatar that represents me and blah, 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 blah. In many ways, we're in a metaverse right now, the three of us. We're all interacting digitally. Um, we're having a shared experience. And the technology that, that we have right here and that all these leaders on that are listening you know, when you change your background or when you're able to work from Hawaii and pretend you're in New York or whatever, <laughs> um, this is all meta, that, that's all metaverse. It's all early mm-hmm. versions of it. The concept of VR and AR, virtual reality and augmented reality, is just taking that to the next level. So, for example, we're partnering with a really exciting company. I'm not allowed to say who, but they, companies like um, car designers, architects, they're going to be existing on Zoom calls where right in front of them, they'll all be able to, co- to collaborate on AutoCAD designs in real time that are literally appearing on their desk, right? Wow. It's um, the, they'll be able to either, they don't have to have headphones or headsets. This company, they're doing it on iPads. We'd all have an iPad beside us. Mm-hmm. But as we're doing that, it'll be, you'll be pinching in, zooming, changing it. But that one item will be sitting in front of all of us at the same time. And the same way on Zoom, we're all clumsy and go, oh, Susan, can you give me permission to screen share now? <laughs> You're going to say the same thing. You're going to be like, hey, give me permission to change the McLaren's front bumper for a minute. Like, it, it's it, wow. so it's going to go that way. I mean, are there going to be virtual worlds that you put a headset in and go into? For sure there are. There's. It's insane if you don't believe that digital artists are creating 
incredible pieces. And I mean, I've seen some of the stuff these guys are doing. But so what a metaverse is, is it's just um, an environment in which you interact digitally, but it's going to be different for every industry. So for um, the medical profession, design profession, they're going to, the, the teaching um, opportunities are infinite. I mean, being able to 3D model things and blow them up and go into them is going to be incredible. For the creative industry to be able to collaborate, for us to work on, you know, you think of Google Sheets, Google Sheets and Google Docs, they're all metaverse. Mm -hmm. We're all sharing this digital thing and working together on it. But it's just going to take it to a level that makes it more immersive and more seamless. Um, and I think we saw the pandemic just accelerate that. And mm -hmm. the companies to look for are not the gimmick ones. I mean, you're going to see avatars, you're going to see this stuff, and it's fun. But it's kind of like, but the things that are actually, the reason that the two most successful companies in the metaverse world are Roblox and Minecraft mm -hmm. and Fortnite, are argu yeah. arguably, mm -hmm. is because of the way it lets the next generation. The reason they're going in there is to it build things together while hanging out. And that's really interesting, right? And yeah, okay, it might be pyramids and you know, skyscrapers and whatever else that don't mean anything in, in quotation marks because it's a video game, but they're problem solving together. And they're, and they're, believe it or not, some of those games play with really interesting geometry and physics. And what's really crazy is when your daughter is going to walk into some of these, let's say she wants to be an engineer and they're going to change gravity on them. So they have to play with and run different math equations in their head in real time. And the really good leaders are going to use the metaverse in ways that challenge their employees, make them work better as teams, um, allow them to express their creativity. Because we're really lucky. We, we, we try to give our teams a, a lot of leeway. So I, on, on my team, I have a lot of creative thinkers. Um, we have a series of, of 3D artists and people that work in that space. But I love when they come with a concept and they literally will – just and you're like yeah just go run with it let's see what happens and they come back two days later having done the work that would typically take them two weeks if they weren't energized <laughs> and because of the tools today it's great leaders are going to um not jump at the hype but just do a little bit of research and find the ones that are going to make your teams think creatively um and and that's the last thing that i think people don't understand is the last Call it 20 years since Google kind of grew up was the age of the engineer. This was when you think about the Google website, it's not exactly a beautiful website. They're multi, multi trillionaires. I mean, let's, let's be honest. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not ripping on Google. Yeah, but it's not yeah. like you go, it's not, it's not like you go there and go, Oh, that's a beautiful website. But because a lot of this stuff was created by engineers for engineers, how do I sort information faster? Right. Mm -hmm, how do I find mm -hmm. like, and, as much as consumers were using it, I firmly believe we're now moving into the age of the creator. The engineers have created, uh, have developed so many tools that are changing it. We do a little bit of work with a high-end fashion company, which I'm not to say, but the way they're looking at their entire um, value chain is they don't have designers, manufacturers, um, retailers, salespeople. They have um, designers, they have craftspeople, they have, they're, they're, they're in-store people are storytellers, their marketers are um, communicators. Like it, It's all about shifting this rote, um, you know, bureaucratic world where you're a square peg in a square, square hole to allowing people to be far more creative. And if leaders aren't going to accept that, you're going to fall behind really 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 fast because as we've seen the workforce now is fluid they move so much faster and a lot of people are going oh well they're just lazy and quiet quitting they're just not inspired and there's other opportunities elsewhere so mm. sorry that was a that was long i told you i can talk 
That's that's exactly the point. We we brought you in here today because we want you to riff on all of these things. I think our leaders are more curious than they've ever been in terms of what all of this means. And like you're saying, our leaders really need to be educated on this because this is not if, it's when. Right? Oh, like it's, in, it's in terms so of the shift. Right. So what is your prediction it, in terms of that? Like in terms of because we had uh, William on from uh, Microsoft, I forget what his role was over there, but he was talking about how they'd done all these projections in terms of the future of work and how they were predicting because of the acceleration of AI that in the next 20 to 25 years, the only thing we were going to really need um, humans for was empathy centric jobs, which creativity falls into that realm. So that's right in alignment with what you're suggesting is true. But when he came on in the spring, he said, because of the pandemic, that has accelerated so much he's predicting that's going to happen in the next 10 years and so i have to ask you in terms of this if this is the future of work and our leaders need to be educating themselves about this thing that's come and called the metaverse what's your prediction in terms of how long that's going to be or, or how long that's going to take so so two things i, I don't want to rip on william i've never met him so please don't <laughs> Uh, but that feels to me like a very engineering way of thinking. Again, yeah. this concept of two things. One, if AI existed when Ford was creating cars, as Ford said, if I gave people what they wanted, it would have been a faster horse, right? They wouldn't have right. innovated and gone to that, what's the next step? Mm -hmm. uh, AI, if it's been designed clothing, is going to get it right back down to a black T-shirt and whatever else because it's efficient and it's like ai as much as there's some incredible incredible tools out there like mid journey and, and, and dale and, and everything else that are literally you can type in words and it'll start printing it'll start creating images for you that are incredible original incredible images but there, there's something about and this is a, I, I'm, I'm not someone of strong faith but the only thing that's ever given me pause around is there a God, is there things like this, is music or and creativity and things mm -hmm. where is a computer going to write, you know, Beethoven symphonies or, 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 or exactly. what the Foo Fighters do? Or, mm -hmm. And if, if they have enough information of, okay, let's take every back three, four, song, 98 degrees, whatever, they can write you perfect songs like that, that have mm -hmm. the same beat count and vocal in intentions and whatever else and they'll be original but they'll <laughs> but they'll be the same but all of a sudden when someone comes along and changes the game it's not ai changing that game right so there's always going to be that opportunity what i do think is going to happen um really really quickly is i think we're going to see a flattening of, of bureaucrat uh, bureaucracies we're not going to see so many hierarchies you're going to see a lot more smaller teams working together. And, and I'm not sure how that's going to pan out yet because as much as the beautiful side of humanity is creativity for music and whatever, there's also still a lot of egos and people that want fiefdoms and people that want control. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I know when, when you speak and, and about leaders, it's about, you know, you got it. It's good to be proud, but it's also good to be humble. And I think mm -hmm. that's a, if we want to solve some of these major problems, not only facing businesses, but facing the planet, mm -hmm. it's about giving up a lot of that ego and saying, mm -hmm. it's okay that I, you know, climate change, like it, it's going to be, maybe I don't need to, you know, drive this fancy uh, SUV. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, and I, like, I mean, the, the predictions for me are things like, I don't think my son will ever own a car. Like ride sharing is going to be, and self-driving cars are going to be just so normal and they'll all be electric and it'll be so quick and you'll just get in the car with someone else and it might even have a thing that separates the two sides. We don't have a driver anymore. Like the design is going to change. Like the Jetsons, Neil? Are we seriously there you going to go. be manifesting <laughs> our favorite childhood cartoon? That's yeah. what it feels like Although, to me. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, I don't know, predictions? I mean, yeah, I guess that, that's one. I'll think of a couple other good ones for you in a minute. But. Well, I just am trying to help our leaders start thinking about this upstream proactively, which is our approach to leadership coaching, right? It's like, what is the mindset shift here in terms of the the, the skill sets that are going to be required, the things that they need to start doubling down on right now, right? In their leadership development and training so that they actually 
can step into this full stride, right? Like this yes. is me. And I know I'm speaking the speak because this is how we thought about it as athletes, right? It's like you you watch game tape for the, the game that was coming that weekend because you needed to prepare. And so that I think is some of what I'm trying to help you to get our leaders thinking about, right? Is like, because I know for Rob and I, we started this whole leadership launch pad mission because we we know that heart-centric, human-centric, empathy-centric leadership is the future. Okay. We oh, might entirely. still be in the early adopters phase, but I think now thanks to the, you know, all of this disruption in the pandemic, it's accelerated even more. So yeah, I think that that's what I'm trying to figure out on behalf of my leaders, right? Is like, cause I got to think in everything that you're saying, that human centric approach to leadership is going to be more important than ever, because that's what people are scared about with the whole metaverse, right? It's like, oh my gosh, as human beings, we need to connect. We need to see each other. We need to be with each other, feel each other. But I think in everything that you're describing, that we need to start thinking about outside the box ways in terms of how we can do that through technology and how technology can optimize that, in fact. I, I, I totally agree. And I mean, I, I'm a big believer, you know, let, let's just take exactly what you said and apply it to this a lot of people debate in office culture versus virtual, right? And technology's given us and the pandemic proved that you can work from home. And it supports, you know, when you look at the stats, um, disproportionately it support it allowed women to stay in the workforce and it allowed uh, minorities that typically had to be home as care uh, caretakers. And mm. trying to force everyone back in the office is changing that and is and, and affects certain groups more than others. Mm -hmm. Um Having said that, I do think that being able connection is important, and some people can do it well digitally, right? They have that energy, and they can be up, and they can, they can but it requires a bit more because you don't yeah. have those those physical cues. I mean, yeah. we have a rule with our team that you have to have your video on. I know yes. I've been on calls with other people, and they don't, but I can't talk to a circle and, and feel <laughs> how you're feeling and, I and whatever else. Yeah. Um, but there's also a place for in-office collaboration. I mean, internet's not perfect yet. So you have, yeah. they, wait, what did they say? <laughs> and then that, that meeting that could have been 50 minutes ends up yeah. being an hour and, you, and now you're wasting productivity. Mm -hmm. But it's also, um, you know, there's nothing worse than some people are in the office on Monday and some are in on Thursday. And but it, it's uh, the, the real exciting thing for me with AI is I think it's only and, and technology as we move into this age of the creator and the creator, by the way, I'm not saying that as like artists and, you know, engineers, musicians, medical people, every, everyone that's good at what they do is an artist at what they do because they find more elegant ways of doing things. They find more efficient ways of doing things. And you can't tell me that um, people that heal aren't, don't have that empathetic touch to understand this is right. This isn't working. So, Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, and, and the last thing too, and this was really, a, the more I, I've been in business, the Elon Musk's and the, um, I don't know, Bill Gates of the world, these multi, multi-billionaires that we hold up as this innovator that is, you know, oh, um, a boss, a boss's boss awesome. and trillionaires or whatever else. Mm -hmm. For every one of them that have a massive ego, I mean, Bill Gates back in the, in the 90s was <laughs> crushing companies and was an awful person. Uh, he's incredible now. I'm a big fan of him now as he's fighting malaria and, you know, giving clean water to the world. <laughs> All at the same time while while enslaving them with chips. Let's be I'm sorry. I'm joking. <laughs> that's a joke. Um, that's or a joke. is he? Uh, yeah. But for, 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 every, for every Elon Musk, I meet, because a lot of people think, well, well, I need to be like that if I'm going to be successful, right? I need to yeah. be this asshole that Steve Jobs, sorry, I don't know if I should swear or not. Yeah, yeah. No, we're all about the asshole berates, bosses on the show. <laughs> okay, that berates people and makes them feel small, exactly. right? Exactly. And they think they need to be like that, that it's, you know, you, you these guys that go to these seminars and it's like, I'm an alpha and we're losing that in today's world. It's such bullshit. The number of guys that I've met that are worth 100 million, 500 million, and just the nicest people. Mm -hmm. And the best leaders out there, this was my, my, my last coach at Princeton. I always steal this quote from him. 
He goes, the greatest leaders don't lead. They create environments where leaders can thrive. Ah! And, and I always get goosebumps saying that because he was incredible. And he used to say to us, yeah. go out and make mistakes. I want to see you try things. I want to see you. You know what? You want to cut the middle and try? He goes, go for it. He goes, yeah. if you cut the middle, though, 15 times in a row and it doesn't work, maybe we need to talk about your <laughs> feedback. You know, you feedback learning. Is <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. You know, exactly. Feedback and also being humble enough to go, okay, you know what? That didn't work. And that yeah. didn't work four times in a row. So maybe I should try something different. Yeah, totally. But giving your employees the opportunity to do that, whether it's, you know, the Google method of everyone gets half a day on Friday or a full day on Friday, whatever you want, as long as you think it's going to help the company. Yeah. Um, that, you know, that's one model. Another model is making sure that um, you're not so much doing performance reviews as opportunities. You know, the whole back at Princeton, Einstein didn't believe that anyone should have grades. Exactly. They just believed you should be able to sit down with a professor and have really good conversations and they would figure out whether or not you would um, absorbed the, the information by how you were asking questions and what you were learning. Mm-hmm. So um, the, I think the biggest challenge for leaders in today's world is, is going to be creating environments where leaders can thrive that because we have more data today than ever to measure certain things. Mm-hmm. So you can spot outliers. I mean, if someone hasn't sent an email in a week and they're in a sales position, maybe they're, maybe they need to <laughs> do conversation there. Yeah. But also someone's sending way too many and they're just copy and pasting the same information, but that was the KPI that you're measuring people by. That's not good either. Uh-uh. But if you've got someone that's coming in and they're being thoughtful about how they're wording things and who they're reaching out to and the research that, that they're doing and, and all these tools that are at their disposal, you know, the, the leaders that are empathetic and, and help people find what works for them is, it's a challenge. I don't envy it. But the good news is with Metaverse, with Web3, you're going to get so much more data. And but the, the key is going to be um, moving past some of these old KPIs and start looking at ones that you, you start recognizing, I'm not going to treat my defenseman the same way I'm going to treat my goaltender, right? I'm not going to, uh-huh. as a, a, another less inspiring quote that a different coach said to me was, Neil, <laughs> stop trying to play like a Lamborghini when you're built like a Mack truck. Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I pretty quickly gave up my skills of being Wayne Gretzky and started looking more at Todd Bertuzzi, and all of a sudden I was more successful. <laughs> God, I love that. I'm dying to know who, which coach said that to you. <laughs> <laughs> but does that, but I think you know the way that you guys are thinking about empathy, and, and as I said, I've, I always read everything Susan writes because it, it reminds me to stay focused on, on, on empathy and, and that leaders aren't um, unilaterally focused on success, but your people. Mm-hmm. And I think that's so important. And we've all had that leader that people will, will rub through a wall for. So no, the way you, you guys are thinking about it and the way that um, your community is thinking about it, I'm, I'm sure if they're listening, I'm sure is completely on point because as I said, it's everything that's coming is going to make, it's going to challenge people to be more creative in the way they think, the way they communicate. Maybe it's 15 minute meetings instead of hour long meetings where you're just like, but um, <laughs> I saw something really cool. Actually, um, there, there was a organization that they were reading. I read a book. I'm, I'm sure you guys have read it as well. It's called uh, humanocracy. Mm-hmm. If, if you haven't, you should, it's really interesting. Um, I mean, it's like, it's like all books take, you know, take it uh, as part of your, uh, as part of your arsenal. But they didn't have any, they, they were talking about the Hadrian Collider and how it got built and had 5,000 people working together to build one of the most um, intricate pieces of machinery that, that humanity has ever built. But because they were scientists and they, a lot of them were ego driven and they were all doing <laughs> independent pockets of research, they didn't want to have a single boss making decisions for lots of reasons. So the way they did it was very Greek in that people would both vote and you had to get a two thirds consensus for every decision. Oh, wow. So there wasn't, there wasn't one person deciding and you had to, everyone could bring ideas and they very quickly filtered it up to this, but it wasn't, you know, I, I'm a big believer. We need to change our political systems to get away from this concept. If someone wins with 30% of the vote, especially okay. in Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, and by having rank balloting or whatever else, but you, there's no reason you can't do that in your organization. There's no mm-hmm. reason you can't let your team, because often 
they know the answer, you know, and mm-hmm. you're being asked to make this decision, even though if you're the CEO of your own company, you run a small business or you're, you're in charge of the accounting, the office ordering, the, you know, coming up with the direction for your team, you're probably sleeping at night worried. Am I going to let this person go? How am I going to work with them? How am I going to hire this person? Where am I going to get my next investment coming from? And you're being, and then you also want to make the decisions on, I don't know, what company, what, what competitors to go out, what, what, I don't know, whatever. What, right? mar- what companies to go after or, or to target? Yeah, and then, yeah. But your people know. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, by creating structures that help you do that, it's just, it, and using the tech to do that. And that's where the data that's going to be coming out of this stuff is going to be next level. So, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, that that was very disjointed. But I love it. Uh, no, it's great. I want to know what you want the legacy of all this fabulous work that you're doing in the NFT and the metaverse and the Web3 space, like in this mission that you're on, Neil, what do you want the legacy of this to be someday? So with House of Kiba, we're doing a couple of projects. We're doing one called Gen Zeros. It was the first um, NFT-backed uh live action television show and wow. but the way but the crazy part about i mean the talent we have is, is incredible we have the lead villain from marvel's hawkeye alex ponovic one of our co-producers we have the big show well it's not a lot to call that anymore uh paul paul white formerly the big show from wwe yeah. um but we have actors from huge sci-fi shows like Battlestar galactica of 100 award-winning sci-fi writers tv shows that we produce typically cost you know, we, we only did four, like, eight-minute live-action chapters, like a 30-minute episode kind of equivalent. Mm-hmm. And these things typically take, like, a year to come together at least, a lot of money. We were able to do it so quickly. because We did it. We I met the writers in December. We ideated it in, in January. We were filming in March, and we came to market in April. Oh. Wow. And we were able to do that because every lead creative owned part of the show because we did it on the blockchain. Because in the television industry, typically they negotiate right like back end, but then they never get mm-hmm. to see any of the back end because all of mm-hmm. a sudden, oh, we needed an extra thousand posters in this area. So the producers kind of shuffled this money out, right? Right. But because everything we did, we did it on the blockchain, it was transparent. So everyone on the team could see where the money was getting spent. And I, this story I actually haven't told publicly yet. Um, we, we kind of created this little side company called uh, 200 instigators. And the reason was when we were, I told them we had a much tighter budget and everyone took a lot of uh, pay cuts. All of our actors worked for scale, meaning the absolute minimum they legally could. And some mm-hmm. of these guys gave, were giving me 80% discounts on what they could have charged. But even our costume designer, our hair and makeup team, because what we did for them is their sketches could then get sold to people that were really interested in that. And these are pieces of art. Imagine if if this blows up. Imagine if you could have owned the first drawing of Dark Vader's sc- space suit. Right? Right? And uh, true fans would collect that and see the time and the water mm. that Anyway, so, but as we were doing this, because I gave them a tight budget, and again, we were able to do this for probably a quarter of what major studios would spend. The creative team at one point uh, the sound guy, I think it was, um, we said, okay, look, we only got budget for two of you guys. He's like, no, no, I need three of us. And they're like, no, there's only two. And he made a case for why he needed a third. And it was going to cost uh, 800 bucks for this extra person, which doesn't sound like a lot of money on a you know, six-figure, you know, high six-figure deal. But it, it just wasn't in the budget. And my role is to keep people uh, in, in, in things. And, and just because you create it doesn't mean you can blow revenue. I mean, <laughs> um, in fact, good leaders create strong budgets because it forces you to think, you know, how do we make it the most out of this? How do we move it? How do we be creative? But what I loved about it was each one, uh, our director, our two writers, and our, our two other producers, but it must have been $1,000 because all five of them came to me and said, take 200 bucks out of my future earnings and give it to that person so that they will join the team. Oh my and I was just gosh. like, and the minute they did that, I'm like, that's, that's a testimony, it, Neil. And, and I'm like, forget it. We'll pay for it. Mm-hmm. Maybe they gamed me. Maybe they knew I would do this. But, <laughs> but I was like, no, if, if you guys feel that strongly, that's great. You guys have made a vote then. And it was the team that made that decision. So yeah. 
Love it that. allowed all my employees in quotation marks, because they were, we were all partners. Everyone was a partner in this, from the hair and makeup to whatever, to own the show. So it was a show owned and made by the artists. On the other side of that, because of the way we gave it to the community, um, we got tens of thousands of people that went to genzeros.com. Anyone wants to go and check it out, it's all free online. Um, tens of thousands of viewers from all over the world. We took it to Comic-Con and we had a lineup down the middle of people coming and giving us feedback and telling us about it. And they were writing fan fiction and they were sharing it. And we took some of that influence and it affected the show in real time. Oh, wow. Because now we're not gonna, you know, there's a flip side to this too, which is what, you know, Britain went through when they allowed people to name the Navy ship. I don't know if you guys remember that. Yeah. And they called it Bo Bodie McBoatface. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and and if you open it up to everyone that doesn't have any skin in the game they're going to make yeah. stupid decisions right if no one has any skin in the game it's mm -hmm. going to be anarchy and that's what people are afraid of but anyone that has bought in and has followed our show and maybe they bought one of our nfts that were these really cool pieces of art they want to see it be successful so the feedback that they gave us as a community as a community of community members was so genuine it was fascinating now you, know, you can't take it all, but it, it that then formed the creatives and created this loop. Um, and I think that's what businesses are going to need to do as well. And for me, you know, you keep asking about my mission. My mission is I love trying to think creatively. And my mission is creating organizations where um, you really do blur the line between consumer and employee. You make people that are, you know, the best restaurants are the ones where the people cooking the food are desperate to eat it, right? Mm -hmm. Like the best where people are proud of what they do. And, and, and that's the future of, of work with Web3 is that it, it creates this connection between the consumer and people that's so much stronger. Um, yeah, Rise and Shine, that same concept. Jada Merritt's leading it. It's We'll have to chat about that later. I'll get him on. Oh, we talk about please. a leader. Um, he walked, he believed in himself so much that he, um, he got passed over by everyone back in the MLS. No one wanted to draft him. This is... 10 years ago when the MLS wasn't even that strong, Major League Soccer. Mm -hmm. But he believed in himself enough. So he didn't get drafted in the worst league in the world. Well, probably not the worst in the world. MLS yeah. is going to kill me because we're actually hoping to work with them. So maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe you can edit that part. Edit, me. edit, delete. Yeah. yeah. No, but I mean, the MLS now is one of the leaders in the world, right? With what they're doing for fan engagement and the way that they're growing and helping and supporting the women's game as well. Um, but uh, anyway, Jay didn't make any of these teams. He didn't even get drafted. I was out of college, walks to Britain, essentially, starts in the 11th level and climbs all the way to the Premier League just by wow. being a leader that inspired his teammates. So when he came out, he didn't like the way that youth empowerment was working. So we, he created this, this program called Rise and Shine, and he was running it up in the mountains here in British Columbia. And you're taking kids from inner cities and bringing them up and exposing them to high performance individuals. Because his big yeah. belief was it doesn't matter if you are the CEO of the largest telecom or if you are the chef at the best restaurant or you're an NHL hockey player mm -hmm. um, or a major league soccer player. Everyone has, if you're high performance, you have the same mindset. You show up on time, you're a good teammate, you take accountability. Um, and he wanted to show kids this and anyway he wanted to grow it beyond just this in-person camp so we started looking at it and we said well look Jay, you're, you're doing master class but live right you're bringing these incredible people but what we saw during the pandemic with things like tiktok was the way that you engage and they want to be challenged and they want to be creative mm -hmm. whether it's you know one celebrity does a dance and then a hundred thousand other kids do that same dance but then they do little tweaks on it that make it a little mm -hmm. different. They put their own little flair on it. Mm -hmm. And so what he did is he started taking these lessons from massive celebrities, from Elton John to, um, I'm trying to think of who the ones I'm allowed to name because he's in the middle of filming them, but working with Electronic Arts came in as one of his, his founding partners to help gamify this. Um, and the kids can earn badges and earn real world things. Um, they were working with a, a skier that works with North, North Face Kids are winning North Face jackets, limited edition skis. And, and the worst case, even if you don't win those things, you're getting 25% off at North Face. Like it's, <laughs> everyone's winning something, right? Yeah. Oh, Zoom calls with their, their favorite skiers. And the cool part is it allowed, uh, let's just dive into that one lesson actually. So his name's Ian McIntosh and he has more first 
descents in the world. He fell in one of them. You can go look it up on YouTube. It's the gnarliest video. He literally tumbled down the side of a mountain, fracturing. Like you don't know how he didn't die. He was humbled by this. He was this guy that was flying high, literally. Um, and I meant skiing, not drugs. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and and I just to make sure that, that, that you know, he, he is yeah, an incredible yeah, yeah. guy. So I don't want him to come back. Yeah, yeah. But literally going up to the highest peaks in the world, coming down, and he was humbled and, and changed the way he worked. But he shares that story with kids, but then puts them through workouts that he, and then they have to set up their camera and videotape themselves. And they have to actually do that. And then the community has to verify that they did it. And then they get a blockchain certificate so that they can prove that they did it to be able to earn all these opportunities. And he gives Zoom calls, like one-on-one Zoom calls, one-on-ten Zoom calls, one-on-50 Zoom calls. We have to earn them, right? And we're working with like, the Milwaukee Bucks and Colorado Avalanche. And, and the cool part is, is it says to someone like Gabe Landis, God, Captain the Avalanche, instead of having to drive to the school, which he loves doing, or driving to the hospital, doing these things and spending that time, speaking to the kids, get back in your car and do this, he can just go in the training room afterwards, throw on his computer, and affect so many more lives so much wow, faster. This and this is what and I know that, love about it. And know that they've earned their way into that. Mm-hmm. But they actually, they, they put a little bit of work in to get there. Maybe they mm-hmm. did something creative. So it's that same idea. You're not getting Bodie McBoat face. Some kid that just goes, yeah, you're famous. I'll take this spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're saying to the next generation, that you can do a little bit of work for things yeah. too. Yeah. And then you, you earn them. And I think that's, my mission that's what i want to do i want to i want to create these and work with people that are innovating in that way because i think that that's the future of the world we're moving from this engineering world to this world of creators i don't care if it's music and film and sports or if it's the people that are designing i don't know candles or i'm just looking around the room. Yeah, 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 <laughs> or, yeah, yeah. or a car i mean there's not an industry out there uh, actually, there's a guy that we went to Princeton with. Um, can't remember his name right now. I'm awful with names, dates, and, and, and times. But uh, he went back home to Chicago and is now, he, he works in the waste disposal industry and is so successful because hmm. he came in with a creative mindset and was early enough to recycling is going to be important. Waste management is changing. So literally a garbage man is one of the most successful guys I know from the university because of the way he was creative. And now he's across multiple states. And it's not even just that. I mean, it's the way he's thinking about he because of the services he provides, he has changed the way some of his biggest clients purchase goods because they're either cheaper to recycle and they get rebates. So he's changed an entire wow. um, manufacturing chain. Mm-hmm. Exactly. An entire manufacturing chain because of the way that he was understanding not only cost savings, which is what, of course, all leaders are looking for, but ways to make the world healthier for his daughter. And I just, ah! you, tell, tell, so so if you can't. We got to get him on the show, th- Neil. But you got to yeah. get that memory bank going. Let's go. <laughs> I'll, I'll look it up. I'll be able to find Please. it. But if, if, if you can't, if you, I don't care what industry you're in as a leader. If you don't think of yourself as an artist, then you are doing a disservice to your customers and your team. Ooh, mic drop. Ooh. I love that. Yeah, there and you go. Neil, for folks out there who want to connect with you or find out more on what mm-hmm. you're working on, where can they find you? Um, yeah, so for me, uh, I'm on LinkedIn. It's Neil Stevenson Moore. Um, I've been told I need to start tweeting. Um, <laughs> I'm now getting... Because we've been lucky enough to have a little bit of success, we've been I've been at I've had a couple of conferences and such, and it's I've been told I need to start tweeting, so I'll have to take a page from Susan's book and start getting <laughs> on that. Um, but Steamo S T E A M O one six is my handle. Um, Stevens Miller. We'll put all those days. links. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. We'll put all those links. Uh, I thought you were going to say you're uh, dancing on TikTok now. <laughs> oh God, I don't think <laughs> that'll I'm, be actually, his you know next what? chapter. Uh, you know what? I'm uh, I'm not gonna lie. Pretty pretty incredible dancer. My ego uh, go that way. Susan, now, Susan remember. Maybe I should bust out those stories because I definitely <laughs> remember that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's funny. No, but no, guys, thank you so much for having me. As I said, I, I, I follow 
I follow along and, and, and what you guys are doing is incredible. And, and uh, thank hopefully, you. Uh, so Susan, wait, are you going to run for uh, CEO of Hockey Town? Well, stay tuned. We've got some very uh, promising, exciting things happening here at Team Elite. We're obviously a bunch of retired female hockey players on my bench in my locker room. And so we're just trying to help in any way, shape or form that we can, because we feel like this is our wheelhouse, right? Like understanding how to disrupt culture in the best kind of way, right? In terms of all of the, the stuff that we're talking about today and that we talk about every week on this show, right? Really understanding yeah. what is required to create a high performance culture, which starts with psych safety, right? And all this work that we're doing in and around that from a mindset perspective and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And yeah, I kind of feel like we got the playbook, right? And as a bunch of retired hockey players, we're very passionate about seeing our our national sport make a comeback and like come back even totally stronger agree. than ever. So yeah, we'll see uh, next time we talk to you <laughs> where we're at with that because we definitely are going to try to do our part. Well, look, if, if, if I can support in any way, if you guys need me to make a metaverse or whatever else that, ah, that sets you guys, that sets you guys up. <laughs> um, oh, my God. Oh, for sure. No. We're going to come to you for that, too, my friend. Ho Hockey Canada would be lucky to have you. The whole nation would be lucky to have you. So oh, I hope that works yeah, out. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Guys, thank you so much for having me on the show. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Neil. And, and yeah, I'm um, just the brain's going on bringing some of our stuff or doing some stuff with young leaders and bringing that to more uh -huh. and younger folks, I think would be strong as well. Uh -huh. um, and for us, obviously right. folks, thank you so much for listening. Hit subscribe to leadership launchpad project on your favorite podcast platform. And for all things, leadership development mindset, Sorry, Winston, <laughs> I put his head on my lap. Winston, Mindset, trust and psych safety, DEI, and more. Head on over to EliteHighPerformance.com. Susan, is there anything you want to leave folks with today? I never thought you'd hear me say this, but I can hardly wait to get on the metaverse. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. My daughter is going to freak because I have definitely not had this level of understanding just in terms of the opportunities in this space, but also as it pertains to plan our biggest impact game, which we kind of feel like here at Team Elite is what this thing called life is all about. So I can hardly wait to go to my friend Neil to learn all about <laughs> how I can get some of what we got going on in our mission on the metaverse. You know what? We will, I'm not joking. We'll set one up. We will set one up. So exciting. And, uh, I'd be proud to have you guys be, uh, be, 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 be featured in that. So it'd be fun. I love that. And for me, actually, I have a great quote from Sir David Attenborough. And he says, self interest is for the past, common interest is for the future. And that's yes. what we've heard so much today from Neil. Neil, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm looking forward to t t uh, talking to you off mic again so I can hear all the, the, the stories about Susan in college. Oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, Neil's a good teammate. We will not be sharing those stories. Right now. <laughs> no, no. Look, look, those ones are allowed to laugh. That's right. Folks, everyone, thank you so much for listening. And we'll see you all next week. Bye, everyone. Yes.